Hey guys, welcome to another exciting episode of Let's Discuss Cafe, your go-to podcast for insightful discussions on law, compliance, and anything in between. I'm your host Avinash Tripathi, and today we have a truly remarkable guest joining us. She's an expert in regulatory compliance, post merger integration, and risk management. At the time of recording this podcast, she was working with Airmeet, and now I believe she is working with Accenture. Please join me in welcoming the incredibly talented and accomplished Debo Kumar Roy. Debo Kumar, ma'am, welcome to Let's Discuss Cafe. Thank you, Avinash, for the inviting, and I'm glad to be a part of the podcast. Yeah. So, congratulations on being named the General Counsel of the Year. And you know, everybody would start by you know giving a congratulation and asking about your professional career. But I don't want to do that, right? I want to talk about something that is not usually talked about in the professional world: is how to be a working mother. Thank you for the uh, for the wishes on the award. Uh, well, I think it contributes to a lot of stakeholders in my personal and professional life for the award which I've achieved, and it's it's been a long story which has led me to this achievement. Uh, well, it's it's a very interesting to be a working mother, and uh, yet challenging where mothers face their challenges uh, juggling between work life balance in actual sense. You know what when we talk about in the corporate terms. And you know, it's very special. I I won this award uh just the day after my uh, second one turned one, yes. so that's been incredible. You know, it was a very emotionally high moment for me. But if I look back, I had been working as uh, a working mother for quite some time. I got back to the corporate world after my first born after three years and uh, post my uh, you know, non-profit experience in the US and it's been very I think rewarding because uh, it gave me a lot of perspective when I got back to work and uh, from my experience point of view or from a maturity point of view handling stakeholders it's been very um, I would say fruitful because when you become a mother your responsibility index increases as a parent mother or a parent as well as a father as well the sense of responsibility, sense of ownership increases. And that gives a different perspective when you handle your professional life. You know, of course, I, I'm not saying that people without being parents are there's not that much of, does not bring that much of ownership. But in my case, I value time more. You know, the work I used to do, the billing hours I used to do, you know, lamenting on things, procrastinating as a lawyer at times, you know, you procrastinate. You start valuing time. And uh, time is equal to one. And that gives you a lot of efficiency and productivity at workplace. First of all, you know, uh, initially after my law school in India, I, when I started working, I could see people going for Maggie breaks, shy breaks. And you look forward to those as a young professional, catch up with your uh, peer and you know, having chit chat, engaging with people. But after being a parent, you start valuing time. Your catch ups are there. Your socialization obviously reduces because you have to be at home at a certain point of time and you have to be with your kids. But you know, your time management skills increase drastically because basically every minute counts. And that kind of uh, puts a lot of difference in your work. Very well said. Right. You know, I haven't experienced this personally, but one of the guys uh, who was a founder of Y Combinator, he said that if you want to learn time management, have kids. <laughs> so you you reminded me of his saying, let's see what uh, future holds for me personally. But I wanted to go back and touch on that topic of transition, right? Where uh, you had a kid and then you have to leave the workforce and then you have to rejoin it, right? Uh, and in a lot of times what happens is that uh, the area or the sector that you're focusing is not the same one you had before having the kid, right? So how was that transition for you? So uh, Avinash, when I had my first born, uh, we were in the US and I was there with an non-profit. And before uh, my first one, I was not sabbatical. I moved countries. When I was doing my master's, it was kind of scary a break only because, you know, I, I planned to stay in the US and, uh, you know, pursue our professional life. So I thought it's a good way to also because, you know, you do my master's, you get qualified to take the bar examination out there. 
so after that when i joined the judges team boy and then i worked and then i don't know i got an opportunity to work in a non profit organization which was not in my plan to be honest so i thought it going to be a phase but then i had my first child and uh, when i got back to work um i could kind of struggle initially that i don't know how will i manage my work and be very accommodating out there i'm glad i had a very good support system out there i got really good child care out there uh, and i could function but thereafter you know the real challenge came when i moved to india with my first born who was a toddler and uh, the work hours are long and uh, the support system and i had my family back but then you know you need also proper support system or proper kind of child care and um, there were long work hours working on the weekend because we were then start i i joined a startup after a long time i was in the corporate world and i had to push myself really hard but fortunately you know what um, i figured out it's not about working hard you have to be smart to work around it can be long hours but you have to instill the confidence with your stakeholder with your manager with your super boss that you know you can deliver so i what i used to do is that i tried to kind of work during the office hours i used to be early the first one to in the office try to work around as much as possible and of course no chai breaks to be honest you know i hardly socialize on the chai and coffee breaks uh but yes people knew me i used to reach out during work have the conversation try to get down work and i made sure that i was more efficient than others on the time uh the moment you get your efficiency on the time lines and on your work in your quality increase people start giving you that leeway this because confidence gets instilled with your stakeholders that yes you can work this person delivers despite you know whatever but nobody really cares what is happening at the home front right everybody wants result and everybody wants a good executor so you have to be very good at execution and that's what i tried to kind of build on and also worked on my soft skills and uh, have rapport with my build rapport with the stakeholders and that helped me kind of go through run through the mill and raise my first one when the time you know recently i had my second one a uh, year back and when at the time of my second one i had a tough pregnancy and there was challenges given that i was a work from home and i'm very very glad to my founders that you know we had a work from home and it's because we are a totally remote organization uh i have no loss work from home has its challenges because you know you're working from home you're juggling a lot of roles you're at home so people think oh you were at home so you can do this that everything but you know you have to maintain a very strict regime so work for me is that i had a very strict regime like every minute counts and i have been able to kind of train my kids according to that and also have my support system according to that and i'm touch what i've i've got really good support system and helps out here around me and the moment you start managing your time time management is very very essential on this it has worked out over the years so it's been tough challenges are there the first one and then the second one you're managing two kids there are a lot of things around you there are a lot of expectations at workplace also because you're rising up the ranks there are a lot of stakeholder management which requires to do there are a lot of you know last moment things happen but then you have to also work on uh, redundancy the concept of redundancy redundancy means to you know, the concept of redundancy is basically where you are prepared for the unexpected also it might not happen so it becomes redundant if that those situations do not arise but the moment those unusual things arise then your preparation for those redundant situations comes into play so i think that is something i have learned time management and preparation for redundancy yes wow. thanks for sharing that story you know it, it and giving us that context but in your opinion you you were lucky enough and hard working enough to make that transition right what do you feel if you could go back what would you like to change i think i don't want to change anything to be honest right. i think why avinash it's not that i always had a yes for an answer i yeah. had faced bosses i have faced stakeholders i have faced managers who had not been so favorable to my situation who had been at times have faced hostile situations and i have heard it out you know during the group when when i was pitching myself back in india when i got back to india and i was pitching myself for a role in organizations i have heard it out from people oh you are married you have kid how do you 
and you come from the West, how will you manage it? I don't think so. You are fit for this role. It's not that my potential is less. People have doubted my capacity. They have showed me the door. Uh, but I think so. I thank them for that because that helps me kind of build my resilience for the next opportunity. And the opportunity I got, I really kind of valued those opportunity. Had I got a very smooth entry into the market, uh, I think Avinash, I wouldn't have been what I am right now. So I really don't want to change anything. It's just experience teaches you the best. And I think I've been very grateful to the experience where rejections came to me at an early stage. And that helped me kind of gear for the ones where I got accepted and I got the option to work around those things. Absolutely. You know, that's a very positive way to look at the, uh, the your situation. And, you know, uh, that kind of shows in your character as well. But, you know, you have worked in enterprises, you have worked in startups, you have worked in India, and you have worked in the US as well. So tell us about the difference between the two atmospheres. That's a very that's a very tricky question. I'm thinking too. <laughs> there, there are a lot of similarities in US and India, especially from where I had come from in US in the Midwest. They are very family centric. People value family life, and uh, there are a lot of concept of joint family out in the Midwest is quite because they are very conventional and traditional. I was having a conversation some I don't know a few days back with somebody from the US, and the same question arise, and you know what? How do you feel and this thing? And we both agreed to it. And uh, also in India, the same values are there. People are family centric. They value family life, family time, bonding. The difference which I felt is in the US, people are very straightforward. They come straight jacked. Whatever is there, they just come to the point and just talk to you about it. But at times in India, because of I think so the bureaucratic nature and uh, and the social hierarchy is there, people try to kind of point things out indirectly. You have to understand it's a cultural thing. To be honest, you know, even there are underlying uh, cultural things in the US also which you have to understand over a period of time. You you get to understand. But I have been. Um, I think so um, fortunate enough to talk to people or meet people who are very straight jacketed and process oriented. So I did not feel that pinch in the US. But And also the process and the usual day to day life is pretty straight jacketed. Seven to four, you will work and thereafter you have your, because you are doing it all DIY. Okay, well, there's no help outside. And uh, just that you drop your kids and you're off and then you come back and pick up your kids because that's the pickup time so nobody can hold you back or something but in India it's more of you have to figure out your ways to get the right thing out at times uh, there are at times I felt lack of process and uh, there are times I felt that stakeholders or people around you won't like process they like to have a little bit of randomness which at times uh, becomes a little bit difficult to deal with because uh, the moment you put process, you put checks and balances. And the moment you put checks and balances, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable around you because they can't do around and uh, get those loopholes and work around in their favor. So that is something I have seen in India. Wow. Very interesting. And you know, one of the things uh, so, which I miss working in the US is that, you know, uh, so when you say 7 to 4 or uh, 8 to 5, you it actually means 8 to 5. And, and the fact that you leave at 5, um, a lot of times you don't get to face that many traffic. Depends like barring California and uh, Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, if you're on the east coast or in, you're in the middle, right, most of the time the traffic isn't used. So by 5.20, 5.30, you are back home uh, and uh, the sun is still out, right? <laughs> you you can really think about going to a park for an hour. But uh, in India, you can't do that. Why? I'm an entrepreneur. That's probably I'm the reason that the, everyone in my team is reaching back home later than they would wish to but uh, you know why is like you know uh, in india we have that you know that 6 30 7 30 is the norm right and uh like six o'clock right why do you think that's the case where uh, leaving on time is somehow considered to be a sin uh there's two reasons you know the first reason is that in india neighbor is very cheap right so the supply is more than their demand right 
and uh, what I mean to say, it's not only us at the working at the corporate level, it's as, and also your house helps. You know, you've got helps at your home. In uh, in the US or in any developed nations, your uh, house helps have become very expensive. So with your regular salary, you would not be able to sustain a house help. You might have a child daycare or something. Those are also very expensive. They are bill you by the hours. So you value that time. Everybody values time, right? Where in India, because of labor being cheap and the supply being more than the demand, your value for time goes for a price. Your time is not that much value, you know, a person could take. And then a second reason is that, you know, it's a cultural thing as well. You know, I have had managers who had looked at the watch when I'm walking out at, given though I have come in the office at sharp nine o'clock, where the office time starts, 9.39, like that, after dropping off my uh, kid. Uh, I walked at 6 o'clock with my laptop bag and my bag out, and my manager looked at the watch and said, oh, so early. And I I just didn't blink, blink an eyelid, and I did not say, I said, it's time. It's it, Office hours are okay, fine, uh, done. And uh, I'll take the calls from home. So that has affected my appraisal. I remember that. I will not cut But but uh, this is something a norm because everybody's staying back, and uh, even though they're not doing any productive work, um, uh, and also people start their day very late out here in India. Nobody starts their day at seven o'clock, and even if I try to think of starting my day at seven o'clock, it becomes very difficult because my kids are not out of the house at seven o'clock. Over there in the US, I was supposed to start my day at 7 o'clock or 7.15 because my daycare starts at 7 o'clock or my school starts at 7 o'clock. So I drop my kids and they're done with by 3 or 4 and even post school they're done and for one hour or two hours they will be with the nanny or something uh, so in the daycare and I have that much of time because time is equal to money. So I think that's a very socioeconomic reason why there's a difference between the work hours in the US and India. Uh, it's a primary reason. Very interesting. But it's it's yeah. changing. Don't worry. I I find it very it's it's changing because I have come across organization uh, in the last years, few years, and in air meet also that people value time because we are a global organization that uh, people are across the world and everybody values time. You cannot pick up the call at one o'clock and just ping them. Hey, what are you doing? I want this. No, nobody. So if I pick up my phone and uh, slack out somebody and uh, send a slack a message over slack or I want to do a huddle with somebody at uh, my time, late night. Uh, and if it's 4 p.m. around the East Coast or 4 p.m. at their end of the world, then they will not do that. So I think that that kind of it's going away, especially for global roles. So that's really interesting. And so what time zone do you guys work in? Because the AirMeet is a like a, is a US organization, right? In, yes, uh, it's a US organization. But, you know, we have the Indian time zone. People do adhere to the Indian time zone. There might be a stretch at times. But it's up to you to put that limit, that stretch, do you know? How much you want to stretch. Of course, nobody appreciates anybody working. And that's the beauty of remote work. You know, when you're doing remote work, people want it to be more efficient. That's not acceptable. That means you're not doing your work properly. And that's what I have got uh, lucky with managers who appreciates that, you know, do your work within that eight hours. No work, it requires more than eight hours unless you are in a transaction. You are in a, in a time-bound transaction where you have to push uh, that extra mile. And that happens, you know, that happens with everybody, in every individual. At every level and uh, every profession, it can happen once in a while, but not every day, I think. That means you're not productive enough. And that's one of the parameters of the evaluation also. That's really interesting. So I wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, you have done your LLP from India, then you have done your LLM from the US, right? Now you're working for a US company. Do you think it would have still happened if you wouldn't have done your LLM from the US? It would have happened, but it would have taken some time. So tell us, like, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, lawyers in India who would like to work for companies like Airmeet. So what should they be doing? Uh, you know, I always had a set plan. You know, I always work with plan A, plan B, plan C, like that. I have still plan C. That's the concept of redundancy in my life. 
okay and uh, times it has worked very well for me so uh, when talking about global companies now things have opened up law schools especially lawyers or even other professional studies or degrees also they are now more focused on the global market as well because our economy is opened up there are a lot of investments coming in uh, in india there are a lot of things changing up and uh, indians are very much valued as workers abroad as well because we can stretch ourselves we can go the extra mile we can do a lot of things which we are i think geared up from childhood from our schooling days to have that rigor in us practice in us that that makes it uh, effortless for us also to do those things and comes natural to us um but yes um you know i always had a plan that you know i will go for my masters after working in india saving some money going for a full scholarship um i did not want to rely on my family funds for a and then I'm, I don't know why my masters to be honest you know um i wanted to fund it fund my own uh, masters gain scholarship and then go uh, it's not that i have to be an ivy league and be dependent on my father or be depending on anybody on my family money and then coming back because the chances of getting a job in the us is very less uh, for a foreign student given the visa restrictions and unless you have certain kind of sponsorship or you know you hold a residency or something residency status in that scenario i was very clear in mind that i have to get a value out of my money where i am i have to see my roi so i also did my research market research on how much of value on the table you bring with an llm just with an llm and llm does not really bring that value as a course as a degree when you're getting hired in the job market especially if you don't get a job and you're going coming back to india uh you will be treated as par with your counterparts and that will lose one year of your pqe uh that's what i have seen the market spread what brings value to the table is that your interaction out there your knowledge the how much of knowledge sharing you've done and how much of knowledge you have gained from a practical point of view and uh, usually people do not try to work during the opportunity even they when they don't get their visa sponsorship so that they can get the knowledge they understand the work culture and that's what it is a transferable set for you because when you come back to india or very west you know your understanding of culture cross culture communication helps you a lot and that's where your soft skills kick in and everybody can read the law who is a lawyer you don't need to be a really expert when you start working you can pick up the law book you can pick up your materials and you can go through it if you're smart enough and it's assumption when you go into a masters degree you already are smart enough to pursue that right but it's during the journey that what you engage yourself into how much of work experience because there are a lot of clinics happening like for example there's a lot of clinics for family law welfare law uh, there are a lot of clinics for immigration lawyers you work in the area of interest like i did my research assistantship and i my assistantship where i earned and while i learned uh, with one of my professors and i was interested at that point of time on data privacy information technology so i i worked over there i gained experience i networked so these things are the value add adds which come to you as a professional during your llm journey but yes of course if you don't want to pursue llm it's fine you can go for a global company or a company which is a multinational in india and you try to be in teams which have global interactions that also brings a lot of value and uh, if you are with the right kind of people right kind of uh, uh, stakeholders or teams you are able to engage and learn and then go up and be in a global company or in global roles well said i don't know this is what surprises me like you know there are the students going for an mba in the us they are indian students more or less the same caliber right going for an llm right why the percentage of getting place in the mba students is so high when you compare it the percentages of people getting placed after an llm in the us an mba is a generalist they are not subject matter expert they are not smes lawyers are smes to be honest if you come into the corporate world and uh, the way the world has also kind of divided the jurisdiction wise law is divided into jurisdiction wise they separated as per jurisdiction so the laws of that country is there to protect the lawyers who are graduating from there 
Like for example, the entry for a foreign lawyer in India is quite difficult. Similarly, a lawyer from India, his or her entry in the US or any other country would be difficult. There are certain criteria to take the bar and qualify the bar and know the thing. So it's a very geography specific profession. That's one of the reasons, you know, as an MBA, you know, I've seen my spouse, he pursued his MBA in the US and I've seen the friends I've got in the US who are all done their MBA in the US. But the job market is such, of course, there are visa restrictions and everything. But you know, the hurdles which you have to cross after the MBA from the B school is lesser. And uh, MBAs are generalists, they are not SMEs. So when you are a lawyer, you have to kind of clear the bar, clear this, you have to understand that. And there's a lot of social interaction while in the, as a lawyer. So you have to understand those dynamics also. Right. And see, this is what I feel. I don't know whether it's fair or not. If they put in technical restriction, okay, if you want to clear the bar, then you must be knowing all the laws there, right? So on the technical skills, you are on par with any other lawyer who's also clearing the bar. But uh, still, uh, I think there's other forces uh, into action and b- because how the culture has moved, right? Uh, and we uh, guys don't face that level of hurdles, right? No, because see, when you're dealing with a client, right, in a, of any other nationality, they will ask you, oh, you also usually want to know uh, the foreign students, they're more into immigration law everywhere because you connect as per the nationality. When you're talking right. about law, it comes boils down to some extent until and the students M and A and everything. If you want to see in pri- private practice or anything, uh, it also boils down to ma- nationality, like you no know, labor law or a family law or something. You cannot. It kind of those connects uh, demographic con- connects uh, matter or not. Uh, when in an MBA, you are working in a corporate, you are doing in a marketing team or in a in IT team. You know, nobody really sees. Who, from which nationality you are and what you are doing. But if you are there for a legal aid camp, uh, you are there, people will ask you, oh, you are there. So you have to see, like, for example, that can be why it helped me when I, I joined the law, I joined Southwest uh, Michigan Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, I could connect with a lot of uh, girls who were uh, human traffic survivors. And because, you know, my appearance were a lot like them. Um, because there are a lot of Latin American uh, human traffic survivors, you know, this from nationalities from Latin American uh, countries, they are into as human traffic survivors they come, and I could connect with them and I could kind of gauge with them as they are being immigrants and I am being an immigrant. They could figure out and we could gauge them. We can talk to them. Uh, those small connects happen. Like I was, I've inspected my first one. And I came across somebody who was into teenage pregnancy. Uh, that's a big issue out there in the US, teenage pregnancy. So, and I could connect with her. When she saw me, she saw from my appearance, oh, this lady, th- this lady is pregnant. So she would understand me. So, so I was very approachable to her. So at the ground level, if you want to work as a lawyer in the US, it's a bit difficult as a foreign national. But yeah, the corporates, it's the same thing. But the opportunities out there, the market is yet still to open. And I think it's considerably open actually in the last 10 years since the time I, I graduated. Right. So well, that's very interesting insights. Uh, you know, um, when you were talking, you talked about the fact that you just don't need to work hard. You need to work smart as well, right? How do you uh, implement or integrate technology in in your daily workflows while also maintaining that, you know, uh, as a lawyer, the human touch also remains in the work that you are doing? As a student, when I was planning for law school, one of the main reasons was I was really bad with nuts. And I don't know, I was not a data-driven person at all in my school. And fortunately, I got through the law entrance test doing with my basic math. Of course, I was forced to take mathematics as a subject until my high school days uh, because you have to take entrance exams. You have to have those fundamentals right and differentiation calculus and everything, which honestly speaking went over my head. Those are very high level maths I'm talking about. Well, at the end of the day, when you're talking about how do I integrate technology, technology is driven by numbers. And as a lawyer, you are also driven by numbers when you're talking to your stakeholders, when you're telling your story. So lawyers at any level, either private practicing lawyer, 
uh, a lawyer at a district court, uh, a lawyer at a apex court, lawyer who is working in house in a law firm. You have to be a storyteller. Now, in an in house counsel to know your numbers very well. How your transactions are happening? What are the bottlenecks? How many transactions are going? What are your turnaround time? And turnaround time is something which is a key word for all of us because all our stakeholders are after us on a turnaround. So the thing which I learned, you know, one of my things, and I I give that credit to the general counsel in that organization, and I'm still in very good books with her, is that she helps me understand the numbers very well. Uh, she encouraged me and she used to tell me, Dilma, whenever you come, you always have Excel sheet, you know, hand. You know, you're really in love with Excel sheet. Dilma, the finance guy thing. I like, no, ma'am. Uh, you know, it's, you have to understand your numbers to be able to implement or tell your story and sell your story to your stakeholders to automatize things and leverage on technology. And that's been one of the crucial aspects in AME which I have done is that from day one, I tried to understand the numbers. What are the numbers going on? What are the numbers coming out? And where I put my effort? Because, you know, everybody says lawyers are cost to the company. Yeah. But the moment you leverage on technology, you bring the turnaround time substantially for your stakeholders, you become an asset to the company. So yeah. that is what our role is as an in-house counsel. Yeah. And I think that is also getting a grip on the law firms also. That is giving law firms also the run for their money because there's a saying that, you know, you build whatever you can build. The associate is building, 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 building. But that doesn't happen because the customer is now very, very informed. And as in-house counsel, you customize your internal stakeholders. So you have to crunch on the numbers. If you are looking for a change in the process, in implementing a process, compliance or anything, okay, you have to be cost effective. You have to show the numbers, how it's impacting your bottom, bottom line. And that how it kind of brings you, uh, help you leverage technology. Over above that, you should have thresholds. You should have uh, certain guardrails where beyond that you need human intervention. Because human intervention is not, required at every stage of your transaction mm. you need to have a threshold and that can only come when you know your numbers you have a risk matrix in place and then you implement human intervention then your human intervention is valued as well right amazing thoughts there so what's your uh, favorite technology or tool to use as in an house council right now my favorite tool to use is uh, Pandadoc yeah. with the uh, integrations, API integration with HubSpot. Yes. Right. <laughs> a lot of lawyers wouldn't know that, but I can understand. <laughs> Pandadoc is basically a CLM tool yeah. and it has helped me kind of uh, consolidate all my end-to-end -end contracts. From execution, the execution stage to negotiation to post execution to repository, so it's a one stop shop for me right now. Yeah, so yeah. and 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 it's 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 easy on the pocket and it gives me a lot of control on my transactions. Yes, absolutely. And for people who don't know, HubSpot has a lot of features, but mainly it's a CRM. So. Yeah. The sales guys are putting numbers in the CRM. She, uh, they were poor ma'am is like, you know, directly getting the deals done. She's putting it in the... So it goes and... through ZP integration. HubSpot has ZP integration right. with Pandadoc. And it goes through. So when the numbers are come, the numbers indirectly goes through the templates and they get placed. So no, but no hunky-dory, no hanky-panky. I know the numbers are authentic. Nobody, whatever is there as the deal, original deal, it comes to us and then we take action on according to our uh, data. <laughs> I know I've been shouted at for uh, insisting about the Zapier integration between a company CRM and a contract uh, mm -hmm. management tool. But trust me, once you see it happening, it makes your life really easier. Yeah, my finance team is super happy. I am happy. And my sales team is also happy because their turnaround time has drastically come down. And they, I think they're the happiest. And I when I see smiles on face of my stakeholders that gives me a lot of comfort absolutely you know see that's that's why like you know we need to kind of break the stereotype that you know these in-house councils are the roadblocks they're not the business enablers true 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 
and i think you should be empathetic about uh, the sales guys you know they run through a lot uh, we always have the image of a sales person going door to door uh it's come to now the same door to day in person do to a thing has come to a virtual level so you know i was talking to somebody uh, and i said you know how many transactions or how many cold calls or how many calls turns around you know things in pipeline how much percentage and the percentage is pretty low you know the effort and time they spend uh and then we say oh they get commission or no they they work a lot on the ground level you don't see yeah. they they wear the flag and they are the face of the organization so if you don't empower them then how will you be able to thrive in your role and you know see people a lot of time uh, what i say is you know because of what i do i get to interact with three groups of people a lot one is lawyer second is the sales people and the third is uh, dev <clears throat> what i really find amazing is that all these three groups in a subtle way have a disgust or bias towards the other groups <laughs> Lawyers think sales guys are just uh, smooth talkers. Uh, developers think sales guys don't know a shit. <laughs> and uh, sales, uh, sales guys think they are, you know, developers are nerds. And uh, lawyers, uh, it's better to get rid of them in the whole. And avoid them, yeah. So uh, in the current organization, you know, I think uh, that's one one of the good things is that uh, people. they don't really like to avoid me you have to be approachable to them and the way to be approachable is to have empathy to understand from where they are coming from why their requests are coming from it's not always unreasonable to be honest uh you know because what i've understood is that there are bigger things to win right. uh, not all battles are not up with fault uh, you have to let go of certain things but you should have a threshold and that's where your risk matrix come into place what are the battles you want her have to win and what are the things you have to let go to win the war so you you have to have that decision and also you have to be aligned with your uh, top management on that and that transparency is very right so you think <laughs> about risk matrix and you know this is something a lot of uh, people won't be able to uh, understand so uh, tell us about risk risk matrix and how do you use that for uh, contract review i'll give you a very simple example you know right for example a has a apple and the b wants to make apple juice out of it so they want to kind of buy it from a to b. a wants to be so if the risk matrix is 70s to 30 that your benefit for your business of for buying that apple is more than your risk what you are taking you don't know what the apple quality is what it is how much of juice it will produce how will the taste be because you could not taste it whether it's sad if it's bland it's, it's not juicy if the risk is 70 to 30 it's a good zone it's a green zone if it's a 50 to 50 uh that means it can be bad it can be good uh it's it's something where do you raise a red flag okay fine uh i need to go through i have to do a little bit of due diligence i have to see whether it's worth it or not i have to do a little bit of market survey yeah. to research or see what exactly the precedence is how much it is and so on so uh whether i would want to make payment on time you know or i want to keep i i will like make advance or not or will i do the payment once to you know or half during the delivery and half when i get the juice and when i sell it and whatever profit i want to share or something like that if it's good then it's okay if i have lost then i'm not going to wait the day that's a 50 is there and then there's a 30 70 okay 30 70 or 20 80 it depends on people okay how much of risk taking appetite somebody anybody has on a 30 70 is that 30% is that you're going to succeed 70% that product is going to be bad that's a simple no So that is the risk matrix that we have, which I have, wherever. But of course, my risk matrix proportion or the ratio changes from organization to organization, depending on the philosophy of an of the organization, the nature of the business and operation, and also the risk taking appetite of that particular organization, depending on the nature, whether it's a listed or unlisted company, what stage at it is, what is the product like. what is the transaction like that's how it is you explain it in a very simplified manner even a like a poll would understand that obviously you know it there's more a lot more nuances to it yeah so tell us about uh, are you using any ai software for contract review 
basically uh, you know telling an ai okay this is my risk matrix whatever the new contract comes in analyze it on these matrices and give me the first round of review we are in the process and we are doing so that's how we are actually leveraging our clm tool right now and we are in the process because uh, for that we need also to have a very detailed and thorough contract paper. Right. Uh, that is the contract manual or a legal landing page. So to inform the stakeholders and also your tool what exactly. And you have to also have human intervention in it because you want to fight against those biases. You don't want biases in the system right. happening. And that needs periodic human intervention depending on the flow of the contracts happening. So we are in the process and we soon should be able to implement it out to further kind of automatize it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's one of the best use cases people <laughs> about the creative uh, <laughs> AI. So now it's the rapid fire round time. Are you ready, ma'am? Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First question. Morning person or night owl? I'm a morning person. Wow. Uh, but yeah, eh, at times, it's because of the kids that I have my night outs. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. Uh, favorite legal thriller or courtroom drama? No, no, I had been now uh, pre law school. I used to be a avid reader of Jeffrey Archer. So, all his, all the movies which have been made on his novel. But yeah. recently, you know, I have been out. Actually, I have not been watching much of uh, thrillers, drama, or anything on screen. My screen time is basically Coco Melon okay. or, uh, you know, or a boy or a mind kind of thing. <laughs> Baby kids. shark, do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> I have a couple of nephews, so I know. <laughs> so, so but, but recently, you know, I came across Mamla Legal Hair uh, in on Netflix. And I think so that's a very good depiction of, uh, obviously, Will's depiction of the true reality at, at the district court. Uh, I, I offered you know Indian judiciary, and I think so. Things couldn't have been better than the I would say sarcastic. <laughs> uh, I would say tolerant or sarcastic sarcasm brought through that drama. What exactly a trial lawyer faces in India? The trial is great choice there. Next question is one legal term you would love to demystify for our listeners. Um, you know everybody talks about Indian. You know, any interview go and say like, oh, what is an indemnification? Can I explain it out to me? <laughs> and it's very heavy, you know, the concept. Indemnification is nothing. It's in simply words, as I mentioned about the apples, seller apples, you know, on the risk matrix. It's basically stepping into others' shoes and taking the risk for them. Yeah. That's it. Bearing the So being a shield to the other person against any third party liability. That's indemnification. Well, explained. Uh, dream travel destination for unwinding after a busy week. I guess uh, on the banks of uh, Ganga or uh, Bhagirathi uh, in the Himalayas. Wow. Well, I think before, you know, I think a place called Deep Prayag before she came. From there and upwards. Yeah, it's a lovely place. Uh Coffee or chai? Now, uh, tea. Tea, English tea in a teapot with a little bit of sugar and a tad bit of uh, milk. Okay. I love it. <laughs> what should go first, tea or milk? Uh, tea. <laughs> yeah. Milk is very this thing. You should savor the flavor of tea. It's I'm not a c- cutting chai person or a, uh, or a coffee person with a lot of milk and sugar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the last question is a hobby that keeps you grounded outside the work. Um, I would say it's it's something which goes with my profession also. Lots and lots of reading, <laughs> uh, and keeping your eyes and ears open. Uh, my theory of redundancy, sorry, abundance. I would say abundance. Yes, it is the abundance of reading, abundance of books. I I like, but yeah, the theory of redundancy works out there. And I think so that keeps me grounded. You know, you as a professional, you should always keep your ears and eyes open. And uh, along with that, uh, connecting those reading or experiences which I get to, I, I read a lot of about other things also, about other subjects, history, geography, anything which comes across my way. And try to try translate them also into my dishes. 
So cooking is something which keeps you very humble and grounded along with that. Hmm. Well said. So this brings an end to the podcast. Thanks a lot for joining us today, ma'am. Thank you, Avinash. It's been a pleasure being on the podcast and sharing such nice moments with you and sharing <laughs> th- thoughts. So yeah, thanks a lot. The feeling is quite mutual, ma'am. That brings us to the end of this enlightening episode of Let's Discuss Cafe. A massive thank you to Debu Bama for sharing her incredible journey and invaluable insights with us. For our listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe to Let's Discuss Cafe on your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to leave us a review and share this episode within your network. Connect with us on social media to stay updated on upcoming episodes and special guests. Once again, I'm your host Avinash Tripathi and this has been Let's Discuss Cafe. Until next time, stay curious, stay caffeinated. Goodbye.